All right. Done. Okay. So I'd like to welcome everybody to our next webinar, which will be given by Atit Dut, who is from Mexico. So we are so excited to be hosting these webinars as part of a new journal, the Research Journal in Medical and Health Sciences. And I am the editor-in-chief, Thomas Webster. I do encourage you to go to the journal website to learn more about this new journal. We are obviously publishing everything in the context of medicine, health sciences. We are now accepting papers. You can see the website right there on the journal. We have a hybrid publishing model, um, both traditional subscription publications as well as open access. We rapidly pu publish papers that undergo peer review. So my last slide before introducing Atit is this is what we are committed to doing for the journal. As you know, journals are more than just publishing papers these days. So we host things like these webinars, newsletters that highlight people's research. We give authors an update on uh, how many times their papers have been downloaded and read. I think that's very important information for everybody. And we promote your research. So we strongly encourage you to submit papers to the Research Journal in Medical and Health Sciences. So after that too long of an introduction <laughs> to the journal, let me introduce um, our speaker today who I had the chance to meet in Mexico uh, not too long ago in a different part of Mexico than, than where he is located, but Dr. Atit Dut, who is an investigator for the Institute of Materials Investigation uh, in Mexico, that's a part of the, uh, I think, National Autonomous University of Mexico. I'm not going to do this in Spanish because my Spanish is awful, but Atit uh, received his bachelor's degree of technology from Punjab Technical University and a master's in nanotechnology from VIT, Valor Institute of Technology, where I happen to be a visiting professor. He got his PhD in electrical engineering in solid state electronics from Sin Vestav uh, in Mexico City. And he did two years of a postdoc at the Institute of Materials Investigation. So he's published a lot of papers. Uh, he's had received a lot of awards and his primary research as we were well about to hear is focused on the development of silicon, zinc oxide, molybdenum oxide, I'm sure additional oxides too, for various optoelectronic properties. So Atit, thank you for accepting our invitation to present dealing with our technical <laughs> difficulties today. And we very much look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Webster. Okay, so let me try to share the screen and presentation. Uh, I think you have to give me the access. Now you have the access. You're the host, actually. <laughs> yeah. So let me let me toss it back over to you. Thank you. Or you can just give me the access because if you toss back to me, then I think the recording goes here. We have to check actually. But it's fine. Okay. I will try to share the screen. Still recording. So we're we're good. Yes. So everybody too. We record these. We post them on our website. So please tell your friends and colleagues. Um, about a teeth wonderful talk. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, please let me know if you can share, uh, see the screen, the presentation. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so thank you, Dr. Webster. Thank you, the journal, for giving me the opportunity to present my work here. I'm a teeth that working as a full time investigator in UNAM, that's in Mexico. And today I'm going to talk about some of the energy and health sector applications of nanomaterials we are developing in. Our laboratory. Okay, so starting with the introduction of Mexico. Mexico City is a huge city. The light now the population is around 8.2 uh, million. And in the Mexico City, we have a blend of modern architecture, old buildings, old architecture. So it's a very nice city to visit. So I welcome anyone if you want to come here. I can give you the tour. If you want to know more about the UNAM, I'll be very happy to show you around. UNAM, that's in the south part of Mexico City. If you see the aerial diameter, it's like 3.5 to 4 kilometers. 
let me start my pointer. Okay. So here in this part, you can see it's a, a Olympic size stadium of football. Inside we have campus of also Olympic size. Uh, uh, okay, so there was some problem. Also, we have uh, that swimming pool inside. It's a huge campus and it's in the south part of Mexico City, like I told you. Ranking, the UNAM ranking right now in the world, it's 105. And especially talking about the uh, engineering wing, it's 15, the top 15 in the world. Uh, let me unmute because there is some problem. Okay, there's some problem with the one of the participants. Done. Okay, so now I'm ranking, I was saying it's on the top 100 right now, and the engineering week, it's in the top 50. Let's go ahead. So this is the building of uh, national uh, central building of the library of UNAM that's in the world heritage list. And there are around three buildings to four buildings of UNAM. They are listed in the UNESCO projects. So it's a beautiful campus, old campus to visit. And also it's like we have the old architecture plus new buildings and we are working together to reach the goal of this, uh, getting a better uh, investigation. So in this particular presentation, I'm going to talk about two different materials, zinc oxide, silicon for their different applications like biosensing, hydrogen production, luminescence, solar cell devices, et cetera. The results I'm going to present here, they are from the last uh, four to five years from 2018 onwards. Collaborations. So the thing is, in my research, what I'm doing, I'm doing a lot of work with different collaborators. So in this slide, by this slide, I would like to thank all of the collaborations, national, international collaborations. Because of them, I'm able to present my work here. As said by uh, Red Hoffman, he says, no matter how brilliant your mind or strategy, if you're playing a solo game, you will always lose out to a team. And on the other side, Oliver Wendell Holmes, he says, uh, many ideas grow better when transplanted into another mind than the one that they sprung up. So we know the value of collaborations. That's what I'm trying to do now. I'm trying to work with different experts in the different fields. And together we are trying to achieve this multidisciplinary field of uh, nanomaterials, actually. We are trying to solve the problems in the form of solar cells, biosensing, and catalysis. Let's go ahead with some introduction of nanotechnology. So how small is nano? I'll give you some examples. So if you have the ratio of this football in the earth, then the same ratio of this pollen, that's it, one of the smallest nanoparticles, uh, carbon 60, the ratio of this one on the football. So you can imagine football in earth and then this nanoparticle in the football. You're talking about extremely small. On the other side, it's a 1 million times smaller than the smallest measurement you can do with this ruler. So it's extremely small. We cannot see with the naked eyes. We need highly specialized equipments for the preparation and also for the characterization. Now the question is, did scientists create nano? No, it was already in nature. How? For example, we know this uh, anatomy of our human body. We have centimeters to micrometers, then we have organs in micrometers, and then we go inside. We have DNA, we have cell, we have blood vessels, and those we can see till nanometers. The thing is, before we didn't have the equipments, we didn't have the specialization to see these organs, but now we have the equipments, we have the te te technology to go deep inside, right? In the case of uh, butterflies, we can see when we see the wings of butterfly from a different angle, they have colors. And then they have the scale in micrometers, we can see the parts of the wings inside. And finally, when we go deep inside, we have pigment, okay? And these are the ones which are responsible for giving the different colors of butterflies. So these are in nanometers. Again, earlier we didn't know about this fact, but now we know that how the things are working, we have different optical phenomena going on in the wings of butterfly. And now we know everything is happening in nanometers. I think right now we are in actually, uh, we saw earlier a transition from micro technology to nanotechnology. And then the next phase I think will be picotechnology. 
We don't know how much time it may take, but the next phase is 10 raised to the power minus 12 meters. Now talking about the technical section. So first material I'm gonna work or I'm gonna talk about in this presentation is zinc oxide. Zinc oxide, it's a very interesting material actually. Semiconductor, group 2.6 of the periodic table, uh, direct band gap of 3.1 to 3.3, 3.4 electron volts, and type conductivity, very nice electron mobility, and excited energy of 60 milli electron volts. It's a nice material for different applications. And people have already shown the applications of this material like in solar cells, in biosensors, and different kind of luminescence activities. Now, what we are trying to do in this, uh, in our laboratory is to try to explore the properties of one dimensional zinc oxide, that is nanowires or nanorods. Zinc oxide is one of the most used materials in uh, sunblocks, okay? In, for example, we use zinc oxide, tin oxide, and all the sunscreen, they have a very important uh, proportion of zinc oxide materials. For example, we apply during these times and the interesting thing I was looking for is about the cytotoxicity. So if you go on the repos, you can find nanoparticles and sunscreen. And if you go in this particular web page, they have written very specially this word non-nano, that all the sunscreens, they are using non-nano forms of titanium dioxide and zinc oxide. So that's something we are studying right now because of course, when we are going to apply nanoparticles, uh, like zero dimensional or nano wires, one dimensional nano materials in direct application on the human body, for example, how about the cytotoxicity? That is one of the pending questions. There are new reports every day. And I think everyone is trying to find out how much toxic they are in vivo, in vitro. But for right now, in the application of the sunscreen, they say they are using non nano. One of the first applications I'm going to talk about is biosensors. So what is a biosensor? How it works? I'll give you a brief description, some introduction about biosensors. Uh, in these biosensors, we have nanostructures like zinc oxide in the form of nanoparticles. Those are zero dimensional, nanowires, one dimensional. And then we have analytes. Okay. We have uh, enzymes, antibodies, DNA, proteins, what we are going to do is we are going to check the signal of this zinc oxide nanostructure alone. We can check the signal in the form of optical measurements, electrochemical, piezoelectric, or transistors. And this system it works as a transducer. So we check the signal before. And then afterwards, we do the functionalization of this transducer with analytes, like I mentioned earlier. So when we have the interaction of these analytes with this transducer system, something is gonna change in the output. Something is gonna change in the optical signal, in the electrochemical signal, in the piezoelectricity, in the transistor response, in the current voltage relation. So that signal, that change in the output will tell us if our system is working as a biosensor or not, and how much sensitive it is. So that is what we are trying to do in our laboratory right now to develop some biosensors for different kind of uh, diseases. In case of zinc oxide, among all of the different generation of biosensors like transistors, uh, electrochemical, two of the most common are optical and piezoelectric biosensors. In optical, like I mentioned, we have a substrate, we have zinc oxide in the form of nanoparticles or nanowires or nanorods, any kind of morphology. We do the functionalization of this zinc oxide in the form of proteins, cells, nucleic acid. We study the input signal and after interaction of these analytes with the zinc oxide, we study the output signal. So there is gonna be some change in the signal and that change gives us the idea how important is our uh, biosensor, for example, how uh, well it is working. In, on the other hand, in the case of piezoelectricity, uh, there are some groups from Korea right now. They are working with zinc oxide nanowires. As you can see here, they have tin foil, aluminum layer, captain layer on the top and the bottom. And what they're trying to do is they have the interaction of the molecules, organic molecules. Then this structure, there is some kind of stress, strain. And finally, because of piezoelectricity, there are some change in the output uh, response of this whole system. So these are other kind of generation. They are very well known. Uh, for this zinc oxide materials. But as you can see, among these two, optical biosensor, they are 
better because they are economic. We can produce on a larger scale. And that's what we are trying to do in our laboratory in Pune. Okay, so how they work. So before going ahead, I want to give you introduction about photoluminescence. What is photoluminescence? So we know in semiconductors, we have two bands, balance band and the conduction band. We have electrons here earlier. So whenever there is an excitation, there's an excitation, these electrons will go on the top band. So now we have electrons here and we have holes on the downside. And the difference of these bands is the energy gap of this particular material. But as electrons, they go on the top side, they are unstable. They want to come back to their original place. So when they try to do that, they have a recombination of these electrons and holes. And when there is a recombination, they produce a energy and an energy. And that energy is equivalent to the band gap of this particular material. And that is the emission, the color we are seeing from different kinds of materials. Now, the important concept is when we are working with nanomaterials, we have quantum confinement effect. What is that? So we have different size of nanomaterials, different size of nanoparticles. When the nanoparticles are smaller, we have a high band gap. When they are bigger, larger in size, the band gap reduces. And when they are much larger, the band gap is much more smaller. So you can see here, the concept is smaller size of nanoparticles, higher band gap, and we can have the emission in blue color. And when the size of nanoparticle is larger, small band gap and the emission is in a red color. So the aim is to control the size of nanoparticles or nanowires, the diameter of nanowires, to achieve, to attain the quantum confinement effect. And finally, we can control the band gap of these materials and we can control the emission. The same material can emit in different colors. So that is the thing of photoluminescence, how it works. And in case of zinc, I'll be showing you some of the important aspects like the luminescence, where it emits, the mechanism behind. But in optical biosensors, the aim is to achieve the luminescence of the pure system like zinc oxide nanowires, nanorods, nanoparticles. And after the binding of analytes, we again detect the photoluminescence. So there are gonna be some changes. There are gonna be some changes in the luminescence spectra, shift in the luminescence spectra, or there could be whole quenching of the photoluminescence. The whole photoluminescence could go to zero. That is the main thing we are trying to solve in this case with optical biosensors. And that is the main aim. There are some reports earlier where people have used the zinc oxide optical biosensors for the detection of salmonella and some other uh, pathogens, for example. And what they have done is they have thrown the nano rods of the diameter around uh, 57 nanometers, length is around 400, 500 nanometers. And then they vary the concentration of these analytes. And when they vary the concentration, they have seen that there was some change in the output response of the photoluminescence. In this case, we can see that intensity was changing when they increase the concentration and also there was some kind of shift. And also, apart from photoluminescence, some other people, they have done the measurements using FTIR, using Raman or SERS, that is Surface Enhanced Raman Spectroscopy, and they can see the changes before and after the interaction of analyte. So these are optical biosensors. All the characterizations, they come under the generation of optical biosensors. What is the main aim? So this is one of the slides I have taken from Dr. J.M. Yun from Northwestern University. In his PhD thesis, he has mentioned that they are uh, developing this kind of device. Actually, it's a spectrometer. Then you can see the sampling attachment as the whole symbol is here. So what they want to do is they are checking the signal before and after with uh, this mini device. So imagine if we have this sample, this substrate of 2.5 to 2.5 or 3 to 3 centimeters square, we can check the signal before. We have this pocket size device. We can have the interaction of analytes now and we can check the signal afterwards. Uh, the question is, people ask always, how much better is? How much stable is? How much sensitive is? How better or uh, limited is as compared to the conventional detect detection techniques. The thing is, this technique is faster. That is the main thing. The resolution, the sensitivity, maybe it's not better as compared to the conventional techniques, but it's a rough idea. It's a faster idea of the uh, detection of elements. One second, someone is asking me the, yeah. Okay, done. So this is a faster detection technique. That's the main aim, actually. If we have a population of 100 people, for example, 
we can do the test and we can find out out of 120 people they have uh, some kind of this disease what we are detecting here and then we can do the further test like blood test urine test what kind of test they want and we can go further with the diagnosis so this is the main aim of these optical biosensors they are faster okay the idea behind biosensors if you do a simple search in web of science you can see the search it shows here around 83000 articles sorry it's 83,000, as you can see here, 83,283 reports. If you say optical biosensors, they are around 12,000 articles in the last 10 years. If you say zinc oxide optical biosensors, they are around 210 results. And if you go further, zinc oxide nanowires as optical biosensors, they are around only 29 results. So this is also one of the main uh, motivation behind because we know that we can control the morphology, we can control the optical properties of these nanowires. And if we can do these different aspects, uh, we can control the biosensing properties of these nanowires, one dimensional nanostructures. And in near future, I think we can propose uh, these kind of one dimensional nanostructures of zinc oxide for different detection techniques. Equipments, some equipments we have in UNAM right now. So you can see a cluster system. We have PCVD, PVD sputtering units here where we can grow the thin films. Here we have the chambers which are connected in the high vacuum using mechanical turbomolecular pumps. And then we have a plasma. So this, you can see a small video. We can controlling the plasma unit inside the, inside the system and we can control the quality of the growth of thin films. Further, we have different other equipments like evaporation, RF sputtering. Then we have different furnaces because we have to grow the nanowires at a higher temperature. So we have these equipments, a smaller DC sputtering unit. So this is the grow, these are the grow techniques actually. For the characterization part, we have new port QCE equipment that is for testing the efficiency of the cells we are doing. Then we have artificial solar simulator, uh, that's a AAA actually. We have some equipments for the measurement of current voltage, resistance, four point probe methods, Keithley equipment, and also some other advanced techniques for checking the quality of the lifetime of the carriers, holes and electrons. And for the optical part, the excitation, we have a special laboratory designed for the optical detection, photoluminescence, electroluminescence of these kind of devices. We have different kinds of lasers. As you can see here, we have blue, green, yellow, red lasers, and we can change the excitation source, that is the color. And then we can change the temperature. We have a small cryostat here. We can do the measurements from 11 kelvins till uh, the room temperature. Okay, now I can start with some of the results. So the idea was to use now these nanowires for different uh, biosensing application. How we started? So before going to the application part, I will give you a brief introduction when it started. So the first article we published that was in 2017 on the growth of nanowires. And where, that was a thesis work of Amauri, that was one of the master students of our group. And here I am demonstrating you that we were successful in growing vertical structure of nanowires. You can see the scale on these same images. It's like one micrometer. So in this case, the length was around three to four micrometers and the diameter was 60 to 100 nanometers. And in this inset, you can see we have something bright on the tip of these nanowires. So that was gold actually. Now I'll be giving you a brief introduction about this growth technique, but we are successful, actually, we were successful in growing these nanowires with gold on that tip. When we checked the optical uh, phenomena of these nanowires, we found that they had a very nice emission. You can see the whole sample was emitting in the green color. And depending on the growth technique, they were having different kind of uh, one second, emission bands. Here in this case, the intensity was changing. So what was the technique we were using for the growth? So this technique is called as VLS growth mechanism. What happens in this case? We have a furnace. We can heat the furnace till 900 to 1000 degrees Celsius. The deposition takes around like one hour or something. We have uh, the precursors here. We have the substrates. We have a high temperature. Then we make the argon to flow inside the furnace. So finally, these precursors, they fall over these substrates and we have the growth of these nanowires. So this green color you can see here, they are zinc oxide nanowires and on the tip, this yellow orange color, these are the gold nanoparticles. So gold helps to grow these nanowires. It acts as a catalyst in this case. And finally we have the growth of 
nanowires. So this was a technique actually, and then we studied the mechanism of emission from these nanowires because it's a important topic for us if we want to develop different kind of applications. So we found that the different emissions they act because of uh, zinc oxygen vacancies, interstitial vacancies, the uh, space charge vacancies. There are different kind of defects that can happen in these kind of nanostructures. And as you can see on the right side, depending depending on the defect, we can control the band gap. And then we can control the color emission of these nanowires. For example, in the first case, they are green. Then we have yellow, orange, red, blue. So we can control the defects. We can control the band gap. And then we can control the emission of these nanowires. OK, talking about the first application. So this was the first structure we developed with Dr. Jose Tapia and Dr. Goldioja in uh, Mexico. The idea was to functionalize these nanowires with DNA probe and to see the effect actually, what's happening. So what we did in, the, in this experiment, uh, and that was uh, the master thesis of my PhD, uh, my student, Andres Galdames. He was in master's at that time in 2019. Now he's doing PhD under, under my guidance in our laboratory. And now he's developing more nanostructures for uh, different kinds of applications. In this particular work, we grown two different kinds of nanowires, two different kinds of orientations, morphologies. As you can see in this case, we have random nanowires. They don't have any orientation. And as you can see, they have gold on the tip. On the other side, we have vertical nanowires. They are straight, okay? So we wanted to see out of these two morphologies, when they are vertical, when they are random, which one is better for the optical detection of this particular adenoviral DNA. First, we wanted to check if there is an interaction or not, because these nanowires, they are inorganic, then we have organic DNA, how the interaction will happen. And if there is some kind of interaction, which this or in, which of these orientation is uh, better for this optical biosensors. So this was the growth part. Now the characterization part, what we did. In this case, we have zinc oxide gold nanostructures, nanowires. We did the immobilization of highlighted probe DNA. That's only one stand. And then we found the this interaction with different kind of characterization techniques. I'll be showing the results in a minute or two. And this part is completed. Now we are doing the DNA hybridization using complementary DNA, and we want to see the final results of the whole device. So in this particular part, I'm just going to show the results of this one particular interaction of the DNA, thylotter DNA with the nanowires. So what happened? In the photoluminescence technique, we can see these are the random nanowires, these are the vertical nanowires, and this is the photoluminescence spectra before uh, the interaction. So in this case, this is the photoluminescence of random nanowires and photoluminescence of the straight nanowires. They have some kind of differences in the photoluminescence spectra, but the main peak is around, again, 500 to 600, 700 nanometers. But after interaction, you can see this photoluminescence, it changed. There were some changes in the response and the intensity also changed. In this case, we have normalized the spectra. So you cannot see the differences in the intensity, but you can uh, appreciate the difference in the bands in the final emission of the structures. So we found that there were some changes in the emission spectra after functionalization. There were some changes in the band levels, in the energy levels, which were responsible for the final emission response of these one dimensional nanowires. We went further, we did Raman studies. In this case, we have random nanowires, vertical nanowires, and you can see the Raman spectra of these nanowires. They were quite similar before functionalization. The red one corresponds to random nanowires, and the black one corresponds to vertical nanowires. Now, before interaction, they were same. When we did the interaction, you can see the number of peaks, they changed. And you can easily see the differences before, after, before, after. And in between these two structures also, random nanowires and vertical nanowires, the number of peaks are different. Interaction level is different. So what we found, the main conclusion in this work was that the random nanowires, they were much better for the optical detection. They were more sensitive as compared to the vertical nanowires. Why? Because in this case, we have random nanowires, we have gold on the tip. And when we are doing the Raman or SIRS, characterization, we have more enhancement in the signal due to electromagnetic effect and chemical effect. Because gold, they have surface plasmon resonance. They have SPR effect. And finally, the whole system, it has a resonance and increases the signal of the interaction after with the analyte. So the benefit in this case is we are having more electromagnetic and chemical enhancement 
and this particular system is better for optical biosensing. So that was one of the main conclusions we found in one of the first works. Now the next part, we know that, that there were some changes. There were uh, nanowires, random nanowires that were much better than the vertical nanowires. Now we wanted to study the interaction part. What is happening on the physics part? How the interaction is happening and how we can increase the interaction. Because if we can increase the interaction of analytes with nanowires, we can make more sensitive biosensors. So what we did in the, this work, actually, this was published in 2021, in the last year, we grown nano rods. You can see here easily the difference. In this case, we have rectangular surfaces and nanowires, like always. We have gold on the tip, and then we have hexagonal parts. So what we found in this case, these nano rods, they have a better photoluminescence response before and after the functionalization. And also in the FTA spectra, the peaks, Actually, we found much more uh, bondings in this case of nanorods. What was the reason? We found that these nanorods, they grow in a particular orientation, that is 0, 0, 2. That is the orientation. And when the nanorods, they grow in this orientation, they have more polar surfaces. As you can see this image, this is a schematic we propose. So in this case, when the nanorods, they grow in 0, 0, 2, they have two different sites where the interaction can happen. As I mentioned before, in zinc oxide, we have zinc and oxygen defects. So when we have nanorods, they have more oxygen defects. We have more exposed oxygen defects. So whenever there is some analyte coming, it finds more sites to have the bonding in the case of nanorods. Whereas in the nanowires, we have only one interaction site. So of course, there are some changes in the nanowires and nanorods. And we found that whenever we want to increase the interaction level, we want to increase the sensitivity of device. So always it's preferable to grow the material in this particular orientation that will increase the polar surfaces and we can have more sensitivity from the material. What is the final aim of this particular detection system? Now we know our nanowires, nanorods, they work as the optical biosensors. We have done some studies on the physical interaction part. We have done some studies uh, on the uh, orientation of these nanowires. We know now how sensitive they can be and how we can increase the sensitivity of the whole system. Now, what is the next step? Now we can go further ahead. We have done this part till now. The now remaining part, part is to have the functionalization of antibodies of E. coli, Salmonella, these kind of pathogens we want to detect within our system actually. So this is the part we are doing right now. And as I am from Material Science Institute, we are from physics, chemistry background. This particular work we have to do in collaboration with the experts from biology department, biotechnology department. So now we are doing different kinds of studies. And one of the remaining part we have is the, also to check the cytotoxicity of these nanorods, nanowires. How toxic they are, how the toxicity can change. So these st studies also we are doing in parallel right now. And I think in, um, in some months, in a year or two, we can show you the advances in that particular part also. Apart from that, recently we have also done some review studies, state of art of the zinc oxide materials for cancer detection and treatment. In this particular part, we have found that there are some reports, limited number of reports on the detection, treatment, diagnosis, monitoring of these kind of uh, uh, cancer cells, for example. And we have found that nanowires, in this case especially, they have the production of this reactive oxygen species, which can finally lead to apoptosis of cancerous cells. So this is one of the main idea now that we are exploring now. We haven't started any experimental work on this thing, but we have found that zinc oxide nanowires, they have a very nice potential from the detection till the treatment part of this cancerous cells. And apart from that, in the diagnosis also, people are using these nanowires because they have green emission. So they are using these nanowires uh, nanorods for the detection of this kind of uh, cancerous cells. So this is one of my aims actually to use these nano systems, one dimensional nano six, uh, systems in near future for these kind of applications. Not only this, zinc oxide, they're also very nice material for different emerging respiratory viruses. How we can use zinc oxide there? So we know that zinc oxide, they have antimicrobial properties. So we can coat the gloves, we can coat the uh, mask with these kind of materials. We can disinfect the surfaces of the hospitals with this, uh, this kind of zinc oxide nanomaterials, and we can prolong the life of uh, the, the materials. We can prohibit the multiplication of the viruses, bacteria that could be quite useful. 
So this particular review talks about the potential use of zinc associated nanomaterials in different kind of respiratory viruses. This part also we are doing now some basic experiments and now I think in a year or two, we can have some kind of advances in this particular part. Talking about foodborne diseases. Now I told you like now we are doing some testing of these kind of one dimensional nanowires, nanorods for the detection of E. coli salmonella. But before going into deep, I want to show you some of the, uh, the numbers. So we know that this foodborne disease, they happen due to salmonella, campylobacter, E. coli, et cetera. And nearly 600 millions uh, of people every year, they have this kind of infection. And it leads to around half a million deaths also. So they are quite aggressive. And as we can see in this particular map, many countries, many continents are affected because of this. And there are different kinds of uh, vectors you can see here. Uh, these are the structures of E. coli salmonella. We know that the size of these E. coli salmonella, they are around 400 to 500 nanometers. So we have the possibility to detect this E. coli with our one-dimensional nanostructures. And especially talking about the map. So we are in America, A, B, D, we are especially in this part. So in this section in America, B, we have E. coli, Apex C, uh, Atec, Aztec, norovirus, salmonella. So the aim is now to detect these kind of viruses in food, water, and maybe in later stages in the human body also. There is a main aim of the detection of these kind of optical biosensors. Uh, detection strategies, we can see 38%. Uh, it happens in food, defense, then uh, water and environment, like I mentioned, that is one of the main areas we can, uh, we can detect after food, and then in clinical part also. Mostly the infection is happening because of salmonella around 33%, E. coli uh, 27% and other kind of vectors also here. Pathogen detection strategies, the conventional one, the most used ones we know very well, they are ELISA, PCR, et cetera. But also there are some recent advances in fiber, fiber optic immunosensors or SPR, surface plasmon resonant biosensors. That's what we are trying to do now with this zinc oxide one dimensional nanostructures. So in this case, uh, we have new postdoc in our group, Dr. Rafael Antonio Salinas. He has done some work in his PhD and he has developed some biosensors for different kind of detection of this kind of E. coli salmonella pathogens. What he did is he has grown zinc oxide thin films and then he checked the FTIR spectra of these thin films before and after interaction with the virus. And he found that in different techniques like FTAR, the peaks were changing, there was some successful interaction. And also in the AFM, atomic uh, micro, uh, atomic surface microscopy, also he found that there were some differences in the interaction before and after. In this case, you can see the roughness, pole roughness was changing. So he has developed some techniques actually in his PhD for the direction of E. coli and salmonella. And we found that these zinc oxide films they have some kind of potential for this kind of pathogen detection. Uh, one of the recent works in 2022, he has worked, uh, he developed some transistors. It was published in this particular journal. In this particular chip of three into three centimeters square, he made like 3,000 to 4,000 transistors, if I'm not wrong. And then what he tried to do is, he tried to uh, study the real time pathogen detection. How he did that? So in this particular transistor, he did the current voltage relationship. He found the drain current with the gate voltage source uh, relationship before the interaction. So this is the red curve. And when he has uh, control, he can see there were some changes in the current voltage relationship. And finally, the uh, structure when he had equally also on the surface of these transistors, there were some changes. So he found that whenever there is an interaction, there's an interaction of this equally on the transistors, the current voltage was changing. So what's happening? Maybe they are inducing some kind of resistance. Maybe there are some kind of new levels introduced in the transistor structure. That's what they are studying right now. But in the initial stage, they found that the current voltage, it changes when there is an interaction of E. coli with the transistor surface. And for the validation, they did the PCR and they found that this whole uh, structure was related to the E. coli. So there was no fa a false signal in this case. So they were quite sure that the interaction was, or the changes in the current voltage were due to the E. coli. But now the question is why the current voltage is changing. That is the main 
question right now and they are trying to investigate this particular part. So till now, this was the biosensing part of these zinc oxide nanostructures, zero D one dimensional nanostructures. The other application we are developing in our troop is the hydrogen production. We know we have hydrogen new energy source. In this case, we can use the nanowires. We can have the catalysis reaction and we can use as a new source of energy. Brief introduction, how it works. We have electrodes in the form of titanium dioxide, zinc oxide. Then we have the counter electrode, electron bones from there till here. And we have uh, oxidation reduction reaction and we can have the production of this hydrogen by zinc oxide. So this is the particular band uh, diagram of different kinds of materials. And we can have these materials which have good band gap level as compared to the balance band and the conduction band. For example, you can see here, this material is quite good. And also zinc oxide, it's here. So they have very good band alignment. Okay, so this material is quite good for the catalysis application. Along with this, they have some other advantages like good light absorber. It has a very effective charge separation and we can use this material as a conductor also. Now talking about nanowires. In nanowires also, we did some studies. In the catalysis part, as a whole, zinc oxide, they had like 3,000 to 4,000 articles in the recent five years. But if we go on the nanowires, the studies are quite limited. And the benefit of nanowires, they are quite uh, surprising actually, because in this case, we have photocatalyst catalyst recovery. We can have enhanced absorption, no need for stirring, high crystal quality, uh, and we can have implementation of plasmonic photocatalyst if we have gold on the tip of nanowires. So this material is quite new. The studies are limited, but they have quite advantages. So that was the aim actually to study the catalysis, hydrogen production of from these nanowires. So the one of the first works we have done in collaboration with Dr. Yang Bai and Dr. Sebastian uh, Sprick from University of Liverpool in the UK. And these are the nanowires. We have gold on the tip. This is a real image you can see, nanowire, gold on the tip. And we found that we can grow different kinds of morphologies. Now we have control of the morphologies. We can grow longer nanowires, short nanowires. We can control the diameter. We can control the orientation. And we wanted to see among these different structures, which one could be the best for the catalyst activity. And the results, we found that this particular structure, C2, that is this sample, was one of the best sample for catalysis. Why? Because they have shorter nanowire, they have some kind of nano pillars also, and they are random again. So it seems compared to the vertical nanowires, random nanostructure is again useful for catalysis. And these structures were quite stable till 50 hours we measured and the response was quite stable and good. And again, this is one of the mapping we have done for studying the composition of these nanowires. And we found that this whole structure till here is zinc oxide. And on the tip, we have gold. Okay, now the third application we are developing uh, with this one dimensional, zero dimensional nanostructure is the gas sensing. In Mexico City, like I mentioned, we have a huge population. We have many industries, different kinds of industries. And also surrounding to Mexico City, two to three hours, we have some petroleum industries. So the quality of air is quite bad. These are some of the recent news that came out and they are saying that the quality is uh, quite bad in Mexico. There are sometimes problem in the circulation of vehicles also. We have to stop the circulations because of this thing. And recently the government is proposing new kind of projects. And this project was started in 2016 and it's valid till 2024. The idea is to check the air quality. How we can do that? We can check the quality by controlling or sensing CO2, what's happening. So that was the main idea in this work. This work is in the, done in collaboration with Dr. Kartik in Mexico, and also with Dr. Ajit Kaushik and Dr. Yandar Mishra in Denmark University. So we have grown nanowires, we have grown nanorods. Again, in this case, we were successful in controlling the morphologies of these nanostructures. And the aim was to check the sensing ability of these nanostructures. But we found that that these nanowires, they were better. They had a better sensing quality. And nano rods, they were less sensitive to the detection, but they were faster actually. So there are two main conclusions. If we want high sensitive structures, we can go for nanowires. If we want foster, a faster response, nano rods. Okay, so that was the difference in the two structures. And we also we studied the selectivity of the gas. We did some studies with different kind of 
acetones, alcohols, ethanol, CO2, we found they were highly selective for, for CO2. And the main mechanism was in this case, in case of nanowires, when they are like this, they have the double interaction with the carbonate group from CO2. But in this case of nanorods, only one kind of interaction. So again, in nanowires, we have enhanced interaction. So that's why the sensitivity is quite high as compared to nanorods. But in this case, as the interaction is only at one particular site, they were quite faster, okay? So now if we have to decide that if you want to go for high sensitivity, we can propose this kind of sensors. And if you want faster response, we can propose nanorod space sensors. And also one thing is now apart from the sensing capacity of CO2, we are also detecting the capturing ability of these nanorods, nanowires. We want to capture CO2. That is also one of the main aims to control the quality of air. That's also in the initial stage right now, but I think soon we can have some results. On the fourth part, we are also working with the solar cells, that is dye synthesized solar cells. So how it works, we know that we, in this case, we have nanorods, nanowires, electrolyte, we have two different electrodes, anode, cathode. There is a complete circulation of electrons from the anode to cathode, and there is a charge going on all the time. So what we can do with these nanowires, we can grow different kind of structures again, we can control the diameter, we can control the density, and we can finally control the band gap of these structures to increase the circulation of these electrons. And if we can increase the electrons circulation, we can increase the conduction, we can increase the efficiency of the whole device. So what we did is we grown different kind of nano wires, nano structures in this case, by controlling the different morphological parameters in the earlier stages. And we found that we can control the diameter from 30 to 42 to 60 to 85 nanometers with different densities. And among all of different densities and diameters, we found this particular structure was quite good depending on the absorption limits. So now what we are doing is we are developing the whole structure with this particular diameter and density of nanowires because we found that that could work as a good sensing device. And in this case, we can develop a high efficient solar cell. So this was with zinc oxide nanostructures. Also, we are working on silicon structures. In this case, also the aim is to use these silicon structures in different applications like the electroluminescence. We can see some of the uh, practical applications we have in cars, in ovens, in the airports, and also in the biological sensing activities. Silicon is quite novel actually. So that's what we are trying to do now. This was one of the first works uh, published by uh, Dr. Asayan. In this case, he has developed two different kinds of structures, electroluminescence structures, controlling the size of nanoparticles of silicon in a matrix. And you can see here, by controlling the size and density, he can control the band gap emission of these material. In one case, we are having a white color. In the other case, we have blue color. So we can control the morphological aspects of these silicon thin films. And we, uh, finally, we can control the emission. Also, we are doing some work with Dr. Kita and Dr. Asahi in Japan, where we are trying to find the complete mechanism. We are trying to, trying to find the, how these silicon quantum dots are emitting, because there are different mechanisms again. This is quantum confinement effect, hydrogen defects, oxygen defects, NBOHC defects, self-trapped exciton defects. There are multiple kind of levels. So now we are trying to explore ex actually what kind of mechanism is responsible mainly in our case. Also, we have done some recent studies where we can control the emission of these silicon quantum dots. We can control the color. We have blue, green, red emissions from these quantum dots of silicon. And apart from the uh, basic inorganic precursors, which everyone use in the silicon industry, like in solar cells, we use silane actually. But in the recent works, instead of silane, we are using organic precursors. They are at least TUS. We are trying to develop silicon oxycarbide or silicon carbide thin films using this kind of precursor because we know this precursor is much more cheaper and it's safer as compared to conventional inorganic precursors. So in this case, we have worked in collaboration with Dr. Yasuro Matsumoto, Dr. Shinawas Bharti, and recently we got a patent in this field. We developed one uh, system that is CBD system for the development of these thin films, silicon carbide, silicon oxycarbide thin films using this particular precursor. Now the idea is to explore the potential ability of these kind of thin films for different kinds of applications. Uh, I won't be going in detail about some of the applications. I think already it's been like one hour. Some of the applications we are doing in Mexico is the solar energy. 
what we are doing. So in Mexico, we have a lot of sun. We have a lot of intensity all the time. So in one of the states, northern states of Mexico, that is Baja California Sur, this is the land. This is a national park, actually. So what they have done is they have done the installment of this particular solar cells. How they are doing? So this is the original feature. You can see the size of cactus. And in comparison to human being, they are quite high, actually. So we have to cut them first. We have to uh, clean the area. So what they have done is they have cut all the cactus. They have cleaned the area. And finally, they have installed the panels in this particular area. This section, uh, the installment of panels, that's what we are doing in Mexico. But most of the cells are coming from China, as always, in different countries or from Canada right now. There are some Canadian companies, Canadian Solar, for example. They are uh, exporting a lot of cells right now. In laboratory scale, we cannot grow these kind of cells. They are quite big. What we can do is we can increase the efficiency. We can try to increase the efficiency of these cells. How we are doing? So in solar cell spectrum, we have different kind of radiations from the visible part till infrared part. But we know there is one kind of effect that is thermalization. And in this effect, the high energy electrons, they are lost actually. We cannot use them in the final efficiency of the device. So 33% of the loss in this efficiency of solar cell is because of these high energy electrons. We can use those electrons by using different kinds of phenomena. Uh, those are down conversion, down shifting, up conversion. In our group, we are trying to implement this down conversion, down shifting uh, effect, and we can in use this high energy photons. We can convert them to low energy photons, and finally, we can use in our device, and that could increase the efficiency. One of the recent work we have done is the development of black silicon solar cells. So what we did is, you can see the final cell we have developed. In this case, the size was two to two centimeters square. These are the contacts, the grids of uh, uh, black uh, of silver in this case. Why they are black? Then question is why they are black. The thing is, when the surface is black, we know they are best absorber. Okay, they absorb everything. So when we can increase the absorption, we can increase the flow of the electrons, and finally we can increase the current or the efficiency of the device. That is the main aim to develop black silicon. How we can do that? So we did the conventional growth techniques that we always do in our laboratory. But apart from that, we did some extra steps. We made these kind of pyramids on the top surface. What is the main aim of these pyramids? So whenever there is an, an interaction of the input light source, the light will be trapped inside these pyramids. It won't reflect now. Everything will be absorbed. Okay. So we can increase the absorption and finally we can increase the intensity. So that's what we are seeing here. In this case, these are the conventional cells, blue color and the red color. These are the current uh, uh, statistics of these black silicon solar cells. So we can increase the current and finally we can increase the efficiency of the device. The current efficiency we got from these kind of devices is around 17%. Now we are trying to improve the context. We are trying to improve the engineering to increase the final efficiency of these devices. This work is done in collaboration with Dr. Guillermo Santana and Dr. Carlos Ramos. On the other part, we are also now exploring the formation of silicon nanowires because there are very limited reports on the formation of one-dimensional silicon nanowires. How we can do that? We are growing stenium as a catalyst. And then finally, we are using this thin film of stenium inside a CVD system, and we are growing these one-dimensional nanowires. We are in the very initial stage of this kind of uh, growth of nanowires. And we have also very interesting optical properties. These nanowires, they emit in orange, red color. And the thing is, the main part is now to control or to repeat uh, the fabrication process, to check the repeatability, to have control over the uh, fabrication steps. And then once we control structure, to use these nanowires for different applications. So that's all the conclusion. So I think I have shown you uh, uh, with the sufficient data that these nanowires, the nanowires of zinc oxide, we can use for biosensing, for hydrogen production, for gas sensing, different kind of applications. In the case of silicon, also we can control the emission, uh, photoluminescence or electroluminescence emission. And we can use these kind of materials for different uh, biosensing, optical, optoelectronics applications. Also, we are developing now solar cells based on these solar uh, silicon quantum dots, and we can increase the efficiency of these devices by implementing different kinds of strategies like formation of pyramids or some other kind of new conventional techniques.
So these are some of the con uh, collaborations we have done. This is a work from different universities, different kind of fundings. I would like to thank each and every one of them. Collaborations, we have uh, international collaborations, national collaborations. Without those people, I cannot show the work. I'm really thankful to, to them. And finally, thanks a lot for your attention. And I'm happy to answer any of your questions or queries. These are my emails if you want to contact. And this is my personal message. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Atit. That was a great presentation. I applaud for everyone's behalf on a very comprehensive presentation. So we do have some time for questions. I think I'd like to, to start. And questions you can either ask you know, via the, the audio or type them in the chat box. It's up to you. But I'm I'm very curious. You know, I love zinc oxide, right? Spent a lot of time looking at its biological properties. As you mentioned, its ability to secrete reactive oxygen species to kill bacteria. It can promote bone growth, piezoelectric properties. It's such a great chemistry. I'm wondering if you've thought about any of your sensors as implantable sensors. So taking, you know, a titanium hip implant, growing mm -hmm. zinc nanowires off of the surface to both detect and treat problems in the body. Have you, have you thought about that or are you interested in that area? Uh, that's a very nice comment, actually. That is the main aim, where we want to go, actually, or we want to reach in two or three years, I think. Because right now we are in the very initial stage. Uh, this project was started like two years back. And we wanted to see the basic results, how the interaction happens, if these systems they work for biological applications or not, how the things change in between the different morphologies. But yes, in near future, we want to study the uh, cytotoxicity, biocompatibility of these materials, because also we have to find out that how the morphology could affect the final toxicity of these devices. So those are the remaining things. Once we have those data, I think we will be very much interested in the in the implants, for example, I have already talked to some of the people, and they were quite interested. But the main question it comes is what about the toxicity compatibility, and those results actually they are still pending. We are studying those right now. But yeah, in near future, that is the main aim actually to use them as implants. I think they could be quite useful. Excellent. Yeah, and I love you know you're choosing biocompatible chemistries to make these sensors out of, as opposed to you know, there's a lot of non-biocompatible sensor chemistries yeah. that people are using, but it lends, your projects lend themselves very nicely for um, implantable sensors. So my one last question too is, I don't know if you're much of a computational modeling person, but obviously there's so many parameters to change, you know, the length of the wires, as you talked about, the density, the diameter. Do you do any or does anybody that you're aware of modeling to kind of optimize what are the best geometric parameters for sensing whether it's co2 you know a bacteria or or what it might be oh that's a very nice comment thank you dr thomas again uh yeah actually uh when the interaction happened first time because i'm not from biology field i'm physics engineering guy so when we started this interaction of nanowires with the biological analytes, and we saw these changes in FTIR, photoluminescence, Raman, I was like quite surprised, like organic, inorganic, and they're talking in between what's actually happening. Because with these characterizations, I can see before and after, but I don't know exactly how the interaction is happening. So we have done some basic DFT studies and molecular uh, dynamic modeling here with some of the colleagues in UNAM. And but we found out that they have some kind of interaction because of thylated groups. When we have this zinc oxide, they are negative charged. So the oxygen charge from these species, they come and they talk to them. And in some of the cases, but what we found is sometimes the DNA, they can even enter the nanowires. That was quite surprising, actually. <laughs> so that's what we are trying to find out now, right now, that how the actual interaction is happening. Because if I know the interaction, if I know the bonds, I can increase the sensitivity. If it's the oxygen responsible for the interaction, let's increase oxygen. Let's increase the defects of zinc oxide of the oxygen on the surface and have the interaction. And in this case, nanowires will be much more effective because they have higher surface area. 
as compared to nanoparticles, zero dimensional. So yeah, we are doing that for those things. Uh, again, the results are quite limited because it takes a lot of time to simulate these nano wires in on the computational scale. But we are interested and we are doing some basic studies with those kind of interactions. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. That is great. Yeah, and it shows you how reactive these yeah. nano wires can be. You know, if DNA is interacting so so closely. So, uh, any other questions that people might have? I, I have a general comment. Of yes, course, sir. this is this is an excellent talk, and uh, my question is add on to Dr. Tom's question about implantable sensors. Uh, my concern is: Will this nanowire retain its structure in fluidic system, or they will uh, disorient it or detach from the surface? That's a very nice comment. We haven't done those studies, but we have found in the literature that people who have grown, actually you can grow the nanowires with different techniques, physical techniques okay. and the chemical techniques. In this case, we are growing the nanowires with VLS, that's the vacuum technique mm -hmm. at a higher temperature. So they are quite stable. But when mm -hmm. you grow the nanowires with chemical synthesis, in that case, like you told, there are more effects with the pH and that fluidic system they may affect. But mm. when we have a growth of high stable, high crystalline structures in the vacuum techniques, they are quite stable. That's what I have found till now. We haven't done these kind of studies, but that could be a very interesting point to implement mm. these kind of structures in the in the fluidic system. We have to keep in mind. Thank you. Thank you for but but one uh, one study you can do, you can do some like a bench top experiment. You can buy artificial serum, saliva, or other right. uh, fluidic, which are in the market, dip your nanoparticles, and you can keep checking the mass or, or morphology. Right. This can That's give you some point. idea. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for Just a point. suggestion. It's, it's really a great research you are doing. Thank you. Actually, we have many questions. Again, we are not expert in this biological part. We are from Material Institute. But we are always looking for active collaborations. And I know Dr. Thomas, Dr. Koshik, yourself, we are experts in this field. So if you can <laughs> help me with this cytotoxic studies and the implementation of the, the saliva or artificial simulations of nanovars, I'll be very happy to send the samples. Absolutely. We can <laughs> do that. Happy. Thank send, you. Thank you. Send those samples. Yes. So, <laughs> yes. And I do know, too, something a, a G, that was a great question, something that you can do to titanium. The yeah. plant chemistry is you can anodize them to create mm -hmm. these tubes and then grow zinc nanowires or other nanowires out of those tubes, and that can make them stronger, right? So that could help them withstand fluid flow, mechanical forces. So that would be a very interesting future direction for an implantable sensor. Right? Yes. And the great thing is that now people are talking about infection around the implants. So if you have a zinc oxide over there, that will work as a medicine. Exactly. Excellent. Excellent. Actually, yeah. you can design some project on that. <laughs> <laughs> Please help me. I'll be happy to send the Sure, sure. <laughs> be a great collaborative project. In fact, something else that that uh, Ajit and I have been talking about, and, and Ajit, we should include you too, is I imagine you have not detected or looked at uh, COVID or SARS-CoV-2 as one of your viruses. You mentioned some, some viral work early on, but probably have you looked at SARS-CoV-2 and, and using these sensors to detect that no. virus? No, till now okay. we haven't done those kind of interactions, but again, I'll be happy. <laughs> if yeah. there is some possibility, I'll be happy to send the samples. I think Dr. Koshi, he has a lot of experience on the yes. SARS-CoV-2 detection, so. Maybe I think that's a that's a very good uh, association, Dr. Tom. Uh, yeah. We can, with reference to our previous discussion, we can have a teeth in that project. Yeah, absolutely. I think that would be great. Yes. So, because I don't know much about sensing, but I know how <laughs> to get SARS-CoV-2 to attach to something, right? Right, right. So I right. think that might be an important piece. Yeah, because maybe, maybe this uh, zinc oxide structure support the micro environment of antibodies yes which will provide stability and better functionality to the antigen yeah and surface area as Atit, you've been talking yeah. about is so important in fact 
I don't know if you've ever looked at zinc nano stars. So in the in the past, we have made zinc nano stars that I think now there's some other groups that have shown on the end of some of these wires. You can, it's like a flower. You can right. you can make the zinc have really high surface area by making stars. So Dr. Tom, did star were in powder form or thin film? Yeah, so powder form, but I think you can incorporate, you know, things like atomic layer deposition in order to okay. make it as a thin film. So okay. I, th I think there's a, most of the work I know is in powder form, but I think there are ways right. to, to use it in this kind of a context. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In that case, I have That's one suggestion. Great. Actually, many people, what they're trying to do is they grow these nanowires in the vacuum techniques. And after that, they do spin coating or the deep casting. And like you told Dr. Thomas, in that case, they try to functionalize with different nanoparticles like star forms, tetrapods or something else. And instead of nanowire, they make three-dimensional 3D structures right. with a huge surface area and quite active actually. And they're quite strong also. Yeah. So that could be also one of the things because right now we have simple nanowires, but after that, what is the next step to grow a complex structure? Right. That could be interesting actually. Sounds great. Yeah, I think Ajit and I need to take a trip to Mexico. <laughs> right. <laughs> You're most welcome. Anytime, please. That's uh, I, I can travel with you, Dr. Tom, if you are planning. No problem. <laughs> and I'm happy to receive you here. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is great. And I see Mubashar has joined. I don't know, Mubashar, if you have a, a question for Atit. We're well over time, but um, and I thank you, you know, Atit for dealing with our technical <laughs> troubles today. I, I can close out the oh webinar. Um, can you hand back uh, participation to me, screen sharing? And then I, I just have a slide I can show to, to end the webinar. But this has been absolutely fantastic presentation. Okay, so stop sharing my screen. Done. And I'll so, give you the access again. Great. Uh, Okay. Yeah. That is great. Thank you very much. So certainly we we all applaud Atit for such a great presentation for our research journal in medical and health sciences webinar. As a reminder, you can also see Ajit's presentation and Atit's presentation online on our website. So here's the website. We strongly encourage you to go on there. Look out for our next webinar. We actually have one scheduled already for January from uh, Ravi Kumar, who is now at the University of Alabama. So this will be a continual thing. Um, and again, submit papers to the journal. And I thank everybody for your attention. Thank you for listening. And we'll see you soon. Thank you, guys. Thank you. See you. See you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.